Good morning, family, wherever you are. We welcome you into our service, and we want to welcome the Holy Spirit to be with you so that your place will be a holy place where God can do his mighty work. We have a very special service. It's the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and my sermon will be about preparing ourselves for Thanksgiving. And so, anyway, we just want to remind you that tonight we have a very special guest from Honolulu who has a wonderful testimony and a ministry of healing and deliverance for people who have been in the gay lifestyle. She was healed of that, and she has an amazing testimony. She's going to give a short testimony this morning, but we would like for you to come tonight and be in service because it's hard for people who've never done it to speak to an empty sanctuary, and sometimes Sunday night it's been pretty empty. But it will be a two-hour special at 6 o'clock as usual, and she's going to be sharing what God told her and how God led her to this life in Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's a miracle the way God put us together, but I know it's an appointed time. And those of you who come from broken lives, whether it's this lifestyle or lifestyle of drugs and alcohol or lying or cheating or committing adultery, Jesus Christ can deliver you. And that message will be applied to everyone. So a two-hour service tonight, beginning at 6 as usual. And tomorrow night, she's going to stay over, and we're going to have a question and answer time from 6 p.m. till about 7 or until the Lord leads. Because I've been ministering to people who have come from their bro that broken life. And because the world's attitude is so contrary to the Bible, it's so hard for them to stand, and we're here to support them, to love them, to accept them, and to help them cross over into heaven. So we have that on our agenda, and we would like for you to be praying for that, and we just thank the Lord for his presence. Let's all stand and welcome his presence this morning, wherever you are. Let's honor God. This is his day. Of the seven days we have, he asks only for one back. As an act of faith, as an act of honor and love and respect for him. And when you do that on the first day of the week, which celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he will bless you the rest of the week, I'm sure. Father, we thank you and we're mindful that you are our heavenly father. And we come as healed people saved people, victorious people because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And we ask, Lord, that your healing presence will be flowing out to those who are still hurting, still struggling, still wondering about your power and your love. And we release that in Jesus' name. Make this sanctuary holy place. We offer our thanksgiving to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's worship the Lord. Let's just sing and praise the Lord and let the Spirit flow this morning. Amen. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah, is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah, is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah, is to our God. Every praise, 
Every praise is to our God. God, my Savior. God, my healer. God, my deliverer. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. God, my Savior. God, my healer. God, my deliverer. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the dark, is shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Let us free by the truth, do not bring us. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. The grace and mercy send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Place, Spirit, place. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nation with grace and mercy. Send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nation with grace and mercy. Send forth the word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, there is none like in you, all of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath all that I am never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord of the earth, let us sing power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares 
to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord on the earth, let us sing, power and majesty praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roll at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have made. Oh, shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roll at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. We give you praise, we give you glory, and magnify your holy name. We honor you, we worship you, and glorify your name. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We give you praise, we give you glory, and magnify your holy name. We honor you, we worship you. And glorify Oh, thank you one time Oh, Lord, our Lord How majestic is your name in all the earth Oh, Lord, our Lord How majestic is your name in all the earth We give you praise, we give you glory and magnify your holy name. We honor you, we worship you, and glorify your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let us worship the, our Lord with our tithes and offering. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you can satisfy our every desire and need. Your word said that we should give honor to you with our first fruits and wealth. Accept our tithes and offering as a gift of worship to you and multiply it so that we can grow effectively through our kingdom. Let Christ dwell in our hearts as we open our hearts to you and that it be rooted and grounded in love. And may the strength know the love of Christ that surpasses your knowledge. 
We just thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. reminder for us to give thanks to the Lord and that's going to be part of my sermon but as I said this morning we have a very special guest spending a couple of days with us this busy week and I'm going to ask her to say a few words of testimony before we do our worship uh, you know it's harvest time right in the fall, in every country, it usually is harvest time for their crops before the winter time comes in. And everybody's busy, and that's why there are a lot of harvest celebrations. And of course, the history of our Thanksgiving is when, you know, our early founding fathers gave thanks for how God had blessed them and bringing them over to America. And although many had suffered and died before even that first Thanksgiving, they remain faithful to trust in God. Well, it is harvest time in the spiritual sense, too. There are things that are happening which we cannot see, but God is orchestrating. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Heaven is real. Hell is real. It's not a joke. This is why God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to come. And while he was living here, he declared to us that unseen God that people could not really see and know. And he came to demonstrate God's love for us, God's power for our lives, and his mercy and grace. Well, We've had all kinds of harvesters coming, people that I believe God is thrusting out now to give them new boldness to share their faith. And we know that in our country, there have been so many things to divide us. And I believe that because we threw the Bible out of our classrooms, we have a couple of generations that don't know what's right or wrong. 
And I'm not just saying it because I'm a preacher. I'm saying it because I've tried to help people who don't really know what is right or wrong. You said, it makes sense. Hasn't God put the laws on our hearts so most people know that it's wrong to do this or that? Yes, God has done that. But we have quenched the Holy Spirit. So you know for yourself, before you became born again, that you thought the wrong thing was right and the right thing was wrong until Jesus opened your eyes and transformed. Well, I was introduced to this precious lady who's come to help others who were entrapped in a lifestyle that she thought was normal, natural, and whatever. And she's got an amazing story that connects us to the door of faith. Before we had the transition a few years ago, we were all under the umbrella of the door of faith. Sister Brostick was our founding missionary, our leader. We still adore her. She's already been gone to heaven. But we have her heritage in us that we try to be like her, be faithful, be simple, trust in God. You know, she taught us to live by faith. Don't borrow, steal, or beg for God's house and ministry. You have a need, God will supply. If he doesn't supply, he doesn't need it, or he doesn't need it now. So we've learned these wonderful principles, and I'm going to introduce you to Teresa Shopshire, and uh, she comes from Honolulu. I'll let her give a short testimony to introduce yourself so that you come back tonight and listen to the whole testimony in our two-hour thing. I just want to also say to our Facebook family, we are not having the Wednesday night Facebook. We're having a special one tomorrow night, the question and answer to follow up Teresa's testimony. And then uh, we come and decorate the church so we don't have a Facebook service and we don't have a youth service because most people are spending it with your friends. And I sent out a blast of games, happy, funny Thanksgiving games that you can play because we're not having our um, Friday night service. But enjoy this weekend, but open your hearts to hear this testimony now. Teresa, God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Does, does that have to be turned on? Or just, uh, just speak into this? Good morning, church. I'm so honored to be here. You have no idea. And uh, Pastor Barbara, I just really thank you. I really thank you for hearing the spirit of the Lord. I've been crying out for a long time. I used to, at one time, be able, in the beginning, to share my testimony on TVs, churches, just one-on-one. It doesn't matter. And then it stopped for a while, and it kept asking the Lord, asking people, asking pastors, can I share my testimony? Okay. And it isn't just about the gay lifestyle, you know, because a lot of people kind of like, oh, I don't want to hear that. But it's about exposing the lies of the enemy. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. And you know the word, but he's come, that we might have life more abundantly. And this is our time now, church, to arise, arise. Arise for everything that the Lord has for us. So I'm going to share two short testimonies that the Lord put on my heart this morning. One is a before and one is an after. So I was driving my car one day as I lived that lifestyle in sin. And I loved the Lord so much. I've always loved him from a little, little, little girl. I just knew that his hand was upon me as a Catholic girl. And I wanted to be a nun, but anyway. And as I'm driving my car, thick, thick, thick traffic, I look over to the left, just glanced, and I saw this lady in the car, a little old lady. I just glanced at her, and that was it. I turned off the side of the road. I made a big, huge turn, U-turn, and I followed her. Thick traffic now. I'm following her for miles and miles and miles and miles, and I'm thinking, what am I doing? What am I doing? This is crazy. This is crazy. What am I doing? Following her for miles and miles and miles, and I couldn't stop. I was driven to follow this woman. And lo and behold, she drives up, 
to where the girl that I'm in this sinful relationship with, she turns into her job. Well, first of all, I'm following her, right? I don't know why. Second thing is she pulls into where my girlfriend is working, who was a manager of a Kentucky Fried Chicken. I ran out of the car and I said, excuse me, lady, excuse me, you're going to think I'm crazy. And she turned around and I'll never forget the look in her eye, that little twinkle. And I said, I've been following you for miles. I don't know why. And she said, I do. She said, you're coming to my church this Sunday. And that's what happened. I went to her church, got saved, got delivered, the fire of God. They thought something was wrong with me because every Sunday there was an altar call. I didn't know what any of that meant. So every single Sunday it was down in the front. Whenever she put her hand on my head, the fire just right through my whole body. I never forgot every single time she touched me. So later on, I guess some of the people in the church took me in the back. They said, Sister, you're having some problems. I said, Oh, no. They said, Well, you know, you're coming down every week. I said, Yeah, I want the fire. <laughs> the fire is for us to be spread, yeah? But then they explained to me and I understood what they were saying, yeah? But the second one that I wanted to share with you, this is an after testimony, is that after I got saved, um, the Lord told me to sit down. There's just such a noise, sit down. And I had a good job. And my sister saying, oh my gosh, you know, what about finances, you know? I said, Lord said to sit down, I gotta sit down. So she said, let's go talk to the pastor. It was another church I went to. Went to talk to the pastor. He looks at me, he says, What did the Lord say? I said, He told me to sit down. He said, Then do it. I look at my sister, see, you know. <laughs> but anyway, he wanted me to sit down with this little baby, three months old, was my sister's grandchild, three months old, and just to care for him. So I'm sitting with this baby, and every day I'm just praying the word of God over him. I have gospel music, just praise music. I'm just, but yet I'm like, I'm in a rocking chair all the time going, what, Lord? What? What, Lord? I'm like, what now? What now? What now? See, I was so caught up in the doing, D-O-I-N-G, right? Didn't know any better. So I finally went to my pastor. I said, Pastor, what else? What else? I felt like there was such such something that I had to do with this child because the Lord told me to sit down with this baby boy, you know, and I wanted to honor the Lord. So the pastor said, be still and know that he's God. And when you're brand new in the Lord, you know, you don't understand what that means. So I said, God, teach me, show me what that means, you know. As the months went on, I began to have a love for this child. It was such a supernatural love, I can't even explain it. And I had never, ever given birth to children. So one day, this love just overcame me as I looked at this little child in my arms. I looked at this child, and I said, God, thank you. Thank, thank you that you chose me. Thank you, Lord, to watch this little one. And I said, he delights me. And I'm thinking, delight? How come I say delight? That's not a normal word for me. Yeah. I said, he delights me. I said, I can watch him all day. I can watch him all night, and he so delights me. I mean, he can poop, and I go, oh, the cute, you know. <laughs> you know, mommies are everything they do, right? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I heard the Lord say, and so it is with you. He said, I watch you all day. I watch you all night, and you delight me. And he said, and when you get up in the morning, he said, I say, yes, my baby girl is up. Yes, yes. And I fell over my face. And I bawled, and I bawled, and I bawled. I couldn't stop crying. The Lord Jesus Christ wants a relationship with you. A relationship, not religion. He wants a relationship with you. Taste and see. You're such an incredible God. My whole life changed. My entire life changed. And that's what he wants with each and every one of you. I, I know you have a relationship, but he wants, he wants more. He wants more. And I know you want more. 
God bless you. I love you. Thank you, Pastor. Anybody who's not having a relationship with Jesus needs to hear the story of God's love because that's what it is for all of us. From whatever lifestyle you've come, you came because you found out Jesus loves you. Right, Alan? Alan was a drug addict, came from a drug addict family. First time we took him out to a restaurant to eat, he told me this is the first time I've sat down with people to eat. We never had any meal together all my life. He's 68 years old. He's crying now. But he found the love of Jesus. And there are people that's in your circle that need to hear the love of Jesus. But this is a particular uh, testimony that we're featuring tonight. You know, broken people, people without hope. Jesus will always give hope. And we'll call the worship team again. Let's worship the Lord. Just want to remind the men's ministry that on Thanksgiving Day when you come, stay a few minutes later if you can, or come early in the morning, maybe at eight, early in the morning at 9 o'clock, if the men can come to set up the tables for us so that we can have an eating place under the tent. We want to thank Robert for setting up the tent for us. And he said, it's so hard to put up. He's going to keep it all through the holidays. If you're wondering why, that's the reason why. I appreciate those who spend that extra time and come and give it to the Lord. So let's worship the Lord. Love him with all of your heart. Maybe your life was not as dark or broken, but you were lost and bound for hell. Nevertheless, without Jesus. So let's thank the Lord by singing it. Amen. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all full of sin became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. 
So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's worth, that will bless your heart. I'll sing you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it, for it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless word, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, though the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Think about his love, think about his goodness. Think about His grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. How could I forget his love and how could I forget his mercy he satisfies he satisfies he satisfies my desire great is the measure of our father's love Think about His love, think about His goodness, think about His grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. Even when 
straight away His love has sought me out and found me He satisfies, He satisfies, He satisfies my desire Great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. Hallelujah. We bow our hearts before you, Lord. Receive our adoration and praise this morning. We come with grateful hearts. Thank you, Lord. There's somebody that's been having gum trouble and your teeth are bothering you. Jesus is healing you. Let him cleanse you of all the infection and pain. In Jesus' name, somebody's ears are popping. God's healing you and setting you free. Receive that healing in Jesus' name. Somebody's been in a bit of affliction. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Let him... Renew your mind. Remember Jesus asked a man once, do you really want to be healed? And sometimes when we have been in an affliction or have had a problem a long time, after the initial pain goes away, we kind of live with it. But it still hurts. This morning the Lord is speaking to several to let go of your pain. Whatever's causing it, physical, mental, spiritual, let go of your pain. He's commanding you to. You can obey him and be set free and healed. Or you can keep it. Jesus is setting people free right now who want to be free. Just say, Jesus, I want to be free. I don't know really how to be free, but I've decided I want to be free. Help me. And he will. Are you tired of being sick and tired of your problem, your family problem, your relationship problem, your financial problem? Give it to Jesus. He wants to set you free but he cannot unless you give it to him and say, Lord, yes, I want to be healed. I want to be set free. I'm tired of this pain. I'm tired of this sin. I'm tired of this addiction. I'm tired of this bondage. I'm tired of this unforgiveness. I give it to you. I give it to you. Lord, take it. Just tell the Lord, wherever you are, Lord, take it from me. I give it to you and be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed. We release the healing virtue of Christ. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. And the chastisement for your peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes you have been made whole. Receive it. Receive wholeness. Somebody has had awful thoughts about growing old. This week has been torturous for you. Something didn't work as well. Your memory didn't click as well. Be set free. God will not forsake us in our old age. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And don't let your fears mark your future. 
In Jesus' name, be set free. Be set free. And Father, we pray for Lori and Gary especially who are going through some intense chemo treatment. Let them be reminded of your promises, Lord. You said you will take us through the valley of the shadow of death. Let death just be a shadow to them today. Let their spirits rise up against the enemy who comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Let them receive life and life more abundantly, which you offer. Let their faith focus on your completed work. And let their faith not be in the fear of the disease. We rebuke and bind the spirit of death and affliction in them, in Joel, Eleanor, and others. Somebody's being healed of migraine headaches. Just put your hand around your neck and say, I'm healed in Jesus' name. I walk healed in Jesus' name. Somebody had a choking problem, swallowing food. We rebuke the spirit of death in Jesus' name. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We receive that healing. We receive that healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody has a broken heart. Lift your heart up to the Lord. He will heal you. He said he's come to bind the brokenhearted. Give it to him. Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand clap offering. Amen. Stand on God's word. Stand on his promises. Don't be shaken by what shakes you from your environment. The devil is doing a lot of shaking. And so we need to be strong and into his word and filled with the power of God. God's doing wonderful things, but... It's coming through a lot of shaking. So don't be blown away by the wind. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. And there's a lot of activity in the spiritual realm, good and bad. But we do know that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, and we're on the winning side. How many of you like to win? You know, the reason why I was not excellent in sports, I think, is because it didn't matter to me whether... I won a loss. I just wanted to have fun. I think if I had had a, more, a greater desire to win, I would have tried harder, practiced more. But I was out there, volleyball for fun, tennis for fun, golfing for fun, so they put me in a group with old men that I could keep up with. But we want to be winners. Amen. This is about the last mile. I say, Lord, keep me alive until you come. Amen. There's a harvest out there. You need workers. You need prayer warriors. You need people, harvesters. Amen. If that's your prayer, he's going to keep you alive until he comes. I believe it. Jesus is coming soon. But he needs us to be alive. I I told you, you know, every once in a while, as I study my uh, school teacher um, mentality comes on. So I'm going to give you homework today because we're going to have a big celebration on Thanksgiving Day. And You know, sometimes we don't really uh, understand what it is. And I'm a history major, but I promise you, I'm not going to talk too much about the pilgrims and the Puritans and and the first Thanksgiving. I think you've, if you've been under my ministry a long time, you, you know that. And if you passed your history test, you know that too. But I want us to really know what Thanksgiving means. Spiritually. Okay, so anyway, as I was looking through my notes, I thought, I'm going to give them homework. So 
The points that I'm going to give you, I think I have three or four, is your homework assignment. Number one, empty yourself of yourself this week, between now and Thanksgiving. You know, as Pentecostals especially, we say, Lord, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me. But you know, if your glass is full of junk and dirty, it's no sense if we fill your glass with clean water, right? And so the Lord spoke to me. This message is for me. I, I, I'm learning it myself. But I want you to learn it because we need to be honest before God. If we're going to heaven, we need to let our hearts be transparent before God so he can clean out every little corner. You wouldn't want to come to my house, Alan, and you know me, I just pick up the glass that's been sitting there for a long time and say, Alan, you want water? And I fill it up and give it to you. You'd like for me to kind of rinse it off and wash it and then give it to you, right? So this point, if you can remember it by that, it'll be really good. Empty yourself. You know, in Acts chapter 1, one of the last things Jesus said is for them to go in Jerusalem. He says, I'm going up. I'm going to heaven. My time is up on earth, and I'm going to heaven. I'm going to send you my spirit. But in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, and you can memorize this. Those of you who are scholars, my goodness, you're sending me some good questions and you're making me a scholar whether I like to be one or not. I had to dig in for some uh, material so that I give you the right information. And, uh, but if you really want to know God's word, and ne the next time we meet on a Wednesday night, it's going to be about the, how the Bible came and why the Bible is important. So don't miss that. But anyway, in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Jesus was telling the disciples that they needed to empty themselves. Remember, they had lived three and a half years about with Jesus, saw the miracles, but they went through a crisis when Jesus was arrested, and all of their old lifestyle came back. And the reason why I know it is they went back to their fishing, you know, like, Oh, this, I guess, was a short season with Jesus. We'll go back to our old lifestyle. And let's go back fishing in Galilee. They were in Jerusalem. And Jesus knew them. And he knew that he was going to send his Holy Spirit. Everybody say holy. People who are not born again don't like the word holy because they want to do whatever they want and they don't want you to judge them. But it's not us that judges. We're going to the word, let the word judge us, okay? So in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, And being assembled together, and the Lord is with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized you, with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. So he said, wait. What, what do you think he meant by waiting? If you will read some other scriptures, you'll find that people have a hard time waiting, you know. Uh, one of my gifts, I like to brag of myself every once in a while. And then I fall off the horse, you know what I mean? But growing up, maybe because I was lazy, my father would worry because June worked in the cannery, Kahului Cannery. And he would say, Barbara, go and pick her up. And sometimes they had overtime, and so I'd have to wait an hour or two. But I was a reader, so I'd take a book, and my dad would, when we came back, oh, Barbara, you had to wait so long. But he didn't find me grouchy. Why? Because I love June working in the cannery and me sitting down waiting for her. Actually, I was helping my dad in ministry. I wasn't that lazy. But anyway, 
I didn't mind waiting. I, I, I don't have, and I, I noticed that some of you don't mind waiting now because you may not be a reader, but you've got your cell phone and you're looking up if your friend still likes you or send messages to you or a cartoon to cheer you up. So waiting is not such a problem anymore. I see people just everywhere, you know, they have nothing to do. They're evidently waiting for somebody, but they've got their phone out. Very seldom do I see people just sitting there and waiting with a cheerful face if they don't have their cell phone. But when we wait, two things can happen. We can get in trouble or we can get better. Jesus wanted them to get better. He knew their heart. One had deceived him, one had sold him, one had denied him. All of them fled except John. So he knew that they needed to be emptied. So he says, go to Jerusalem. He did most of his ministry in the northern part around the Sea of Galilee, but the official business he had for the kingdom is in Jerusalem. He would do all of his official business in Jerusalem. This is why Jerusalem is even now the capital of Israel. And Jerusalem, the Bible says, God himself chose Jerusalem to be his footstool. That's God. God said, this is my city. And people have fought for it over the ages, but this is my city. So he did, Jesus as God came and did all of his official business in Jerusalem, including being crucified for us. And he says, wait. He had been resurrected, had lived with them for 40 days. He says, now Go back. He was in Galilee where they had all fled, gone back to their old lifestyle, fishing and all like that. He says, now, no, let's go. You go back to Jerusalem and you wait. And I'm sure they were like us. You know, we wait and say, hey, what do you think he wanted us to do? What are we waiting for? What are we going to do? When is it going to come? You understand what he said? What is this Holy Ghost stuff? You know, I, I'm sure at first, they're like us. They're having conversation. But then as they waited, I believe they thought more seriously. And so St. Peter, my, one of my favorites, because I'm kind of like him. Sometimes I speak before, I think. And he says, and this time he did. He, he wasn't even thinking. He thought, nobody's the leader here. I'm going to be the leader. Hey, let's have an election. You know, Judas betrayed Jesus and he's dead. I think this waiting is for us to fill this place. Let, let's have an election. Well, you know that in the kingdom of God, there are no elections. We don't choose leaders. You don't make yourself a leader. Let me tell you what those of you who think being a pastor is glamorous or whatever you think and you aspire to be glamorous and have this title oh people sit and come and listen to you every week isn't that wonderful no I tell to people to scare them to make sure that they're really called I said this is the worst job in the world you work like the doctor you're on call 24 7 and your pay is not good physically we pray our treasures are laid up in heaven I'm not complaining but if you're called there's nothing else you'd like to do. When you're called to do whatever God has called you to do, he's called you to do it. You see, so one of the questions came to me is, how do I know my gifts? Well, you already have the gift. You just need to have it sanctified and given to the Lord so he can improve you. If you're a singer, give your wonderful singing voice to the Lord, but don't sing it unsanctified. Give it to the Lord and let him use you. If you like to cook, uh, Teresa was telling his, her sister loves to cook every time they had Bible study in their home and they've had people coming from all over the world in their home just calling them up and say can we have a Bible study there and she would have a banquet every week sometimes maybe two times a week or three however, every time, whenever people gather she had a banquet I think she would have been very comfortable in our door of food when we were door of faith. Our nickname was door of food because we liked, I like to cook too. Anyway, but we get involved in things and we let our flesh rise up. And Peter says, I think we need to hold an election. So they had to, 
held an election. If you notice, the guy that they elected that didn't do anything really notable so that it was recorded in the Bible because I believe if you study a little bit of Christian history, God had already somebody in mind to take Judas's place and that somebody was knocked off his horse on the way to Damascus and his name was... My bright conversation is only bright in this corner today. Yes, James, it was Saul, whose name was changed to Paul. And Paul later on says, I was one born out of time, and I didn't see Jesus in person, but he is the one who ordained me to be that apostle. You know, so it doesn't matter if people give you a title or not. It doesn't matter if God calls you to do something, and that's why I believe that that other guy was not very notable, and Paul, of course, changed the world by his answering God's call to take the gospel out to the Gentiles. Notice this, too. It was promised by the Father. Whatever the Father promises you, this is why we need to know the word from cover to cover. Because everything the Father promised you, he's going to fulfill. He's not a man that he should lie. You know, sometimes I promise you something. But because I'm a woman, sometimes I forget that I promised. And I don't fulfill it. If I did that to anybody, I repent right now and remind me so I can try to fulfill it. But you know what I'm saying? We make promises. We don't intend to break it, but sometimes we do. But God the Father describes himself. I am a faithful one. I will deliver. I will answer you. I will show you even greater things that you ask for. That's why the Bible is so exciting. And before I teach on the importance of the Bible, I give you advance. You know, I don't know if people give Thanksgiving presents, but I would like for you to get a good study Bible. In our, in our Bible school, they recommend the Spirit Life Bible. You can write notes. Because I'm going to teach you that it's important for you to make your Bible your best friend. Because you see, Jesus is the word come in the flesh. The Bible is the word of God. And if you say Jesus is your friend and your best friend, let the Bible be your best friend. Because sometimes you might call your best friend, who is your pastor, maybe, and she's not going to answer. And so you, you might feel lost and feel neglected. But if you have this best friend tucked under your arm, wherever you go, in your car, on your table, or whatever, next to your bed, remember, call the Bible your best friend. Your best friend. You'll find that God is faithful. And in this scripture that I read, there are two experiences. First of repentance, Jesus said, John truly baptized you in water. That is for repentance. He says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he baptized them. That means you have decided to follow Jesus. And we sing for you, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. That's the baptism of repentance. No turning back. You might get weak and fall off the wagon and sin a harmatia sin. You know what that is now. You, you try to hit the mark, but you missed it. But you're repentant. You're sorrowful. You want to climb back on. God is not going to reject you. It's not a sin of rebellion or disobedience that will send you to hell. It's some human failing that you need to be healed of and delivered from. So come back on the wagon, okay? But that's repentance. And then Jesus said that, there, that he, we, he was going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. So there are two baptisms. I read the other day, one baptism. But that baptism is called the, the baptism of coming into the kingdom of God, which is the water baptism. But this baptism of the Holy Spirit is when, like the water baptism, when you are fully immersed under the water, no sprinkling. You know, you had more sins than a sprinkle. You need to be dead in that water. One old Japanese lady said, I don't want to get baptized. And so I said, why? She said, I cannot swim. I said, well, we don't expect you to swim. How long are you going to hold me underwater? 
She was a good saint, so I said, not long. Maybe if she was bad, I would have said, as long as it takes for you to re really, you know. But, but, you know, that was a sign of us joining the body of Christ. And the baptism, now we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is called baptism because of the act. We are fully immersed with the Spirit of God. And the Bible teaches us Every day, he says, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. That represents the Holy Spirit is fresh and alive in you. He will supply all your needs. How many of you have had some bad days that you run out of love? Sometimes it's at 10 o'clock in the morning I run out of love, you know. Sometimes I last till about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And once in a while I make it all the way to bedtime. But when I go to the Lord, when I'm low on that, it's just like when you're low on gas. You don't go to your favorite filling station, right? You go to the nearest one. And that's what I do. Jesus says, I'm always present with you. So I just run to Jesus. I said, Jesus, help me. I, it's, it's so hard to love that one that was just so mean to me and said some mean things. Please help me. You know, he's always available. It's so simple to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then your homework is spend time alone and ask the Holy Spirit to cleanse you. He's merciful. Write down, Holy Spirit, what hidden thing or difficult thing, you see me stumbling over a lot, should I concentrate on this week? so that you can cleanse me. Don't keep running. Don't keep busy. Many of us are so busy, we don't have time to let the Lord clean us up. Wait on the Lord. Seriously, this is your homework. And he's merciful. He's not like my sister June. I know she's watching me, so I gotta be careful. One day I'd come from, she had come back from college and I was already home, I think. And you know how sisters are, we're talking late in the night and she was sitting at the foot of my bed. And I was feeling really holy. You know, middle of the night, you know, no temptation. So I said, June, you're my best friend. And I want to be holy. I want to be an authentic Christian. You know, we can make a lot of holy speeches. I was so holy as that. I, I, I give you permission. Every time you see some wrong attitude or something bad in me, I, want, I give you permission to tell me because I really want to be like Jesus. She had stood up to go to bed. This was about maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. She came back and sat on the foot of my bed and went on for over an hour trying to tell me what was wrong with me. And I was thinking, instead of getting holy, I was getting really evil. I, in my mind, while she's telling me, you know, you could have proven this, and I think that you should do this, and whatever. And she went on and on and on. And I was thinking, you're worse than I am. Why are you telling me this? <laughs> have you found that out? When somebody tries to correct you, you find you fault in them and saying they're worse than you, so you try to excuse yourself. And for three days, I was mad at her. But I didn't let her know because I was holy. I smiled, and at the end, you know, I said, June, thank you very much. I appreciate, I lied, all that you said, and I will try to improve. But three days, I was upset with her. And then, the Lord told me the third day, he goes, you know, when somebody comes to correct you, especially if you've given them permission, I learned not to give her permission again. I'm waiting for her to give me permission but she hasn't yet. <laughs> and he said, because you don't listen to my still small voice sometimes, I might talk to you louder by getting a loud preacher to preach a sermon that would help you. Or I'll have even a sinner come and complain about you or whatever. But don't look at the vessel that comes if you really want to be holy. There's always a grain of truth. No matter what words they use, what facial expressions, what attitude, 
listen to the grain of truth in that. And there is no, if there is none, okay, you pass the test and move on. And so we got to be careful who we give permission to. But you know, it's good to have a good friend who will do that. I hope you're brave enough to allow somebody to do that for you. But you, you need to know that they love you because you cannot, you know, I have to say this for Drew, she corrects me, but whenever people have come against me, she's the first one to stand by and cover for me. She knows how I am, everything. One time I took in a homeless lady and I didn't know behind my back this lady was telling a group of ladies, she didn't know that June was my sister. She said, oh, you guys think she's so nice and sweet. You don't know what she does behind my back, uh, behind closed doors, she said. I thought, Lord, get rid of her. (laughs) And the Lord did. I mean, I didn't kick her out. God just moved her. Anyway, but write down. Be sincere, because you see, holiness is important. Without holiness, no man shall see God. Do you hear that preached? But it's God's word. Without holiness, no man shall see God. So it's it's very serious. Number two, the second point is ask God then, after you're cleansed, then ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And I'd like for you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We used to read the whole chapter, I think, while we were doing the building project because I knew that everybody's going to run into each other and we're going to be tired and grumpy sometimes and hungry while we're working. So every Sunday we would stand and read 1 Corinthians 13 and we survived the project. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 8, when you want God to fill you, I say there are two evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit. As Pentecostals, we believe that we can really tell that you're filled with the Holy Spirit when you tarry or wait in the Lord and we hear you speaking in tongues. But you know, if you read the whole Bible, speaking in tongues is not the most important thing as the evidence of the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, Pentecostals, but we got to stay to the word. I'm going to read you where it proves what is most important. I think, personally, the most important thing is love, as you find in 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to read the scripture. And the second is witnessing, because Jesus said in the 8th verse of Acts chapter 1, I will give you my Holy Spirit, and you'll be my witness. So if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be witnessing. If you're not witnessing, you ran out of gas. I already gave my illustration for that, so I can skip that. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love. I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. And is kind. If you ever wonder if you're walking in love, I think the best definition in one word is this word kind. Did what I say was it kind? They say pass it on like this when you're ready to say something. Is it kind? Is it true? Is it necessary? If pass the three tests, then say what you're going to say. If not, don't say it. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. 
It bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? He will fill you. He wants to fill you. But give yourself this test. Are you witnessing? What's all that energy for? What's all that power for? He's going to give you gifts of healing and, and mountain-moving faith, maybe, and other wisdom and all of that. But what good is it if you just keep it in yourself and you're not using it? A gift is to be given away. And we're going to have a list one of these days when we deal with that. What are our spiritual gifts? A gift is to be given away. If I buy me something and wrap it up and keep it for myself, it was not really a gift. A gift is to be take, given away. That's why it tells us over and over that salvation is a gift. Jesus has it and he gives it to us freely. And I did this as a project when I was a young adult. I said, Lord, I don't know where you're going to send me, but I want in heaven to have a soul, at least one soul harvested from all the seven continents. So I've done missionary work in one continent. I visited and planted seeds. I invested money in a mission project in another continent. So I got everything co covered except Antarctica. Anybody have a friend in Ar Antarctica that needs to be saved? You know what I've done? I prayed for people in Antarctica. Because prayers work too, right? But have a goal of witnessing because... If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not only to come in church and jump and down and hop around and shout and praise the Lord together. The prophet's nothing. We need to go and do what Jesus said. I'm sending you my Holy Spirit for you to be a witness, to bring somebody in. When did you share your faith? I, we went to that um, sanitizing thing, and as we were finishing, the guy who invented it, who's the CEO of it, he said, Pastor, before we go, I'd like for you to say a prayer. And so we had a prayer, and, uh, and he belongs to Word of Life in Honolulu. I said, no wonder you asked me to pray. And I said, God gave you this creative idea. I was telling about a friend, an engineer friend, who was working on a project of a hurricane-proof um, house that God gave him in the spirit, and they're marketing it now. But I said, he had a vision of going to heaven and saw, you know, like, uh, like these cubicles where you have building plans, all whatever stuffed in there. And he asked the Lord, what is that? And he says, I've got all of these creative ideas. I want to give to somebody who wants it, but nobody's asked for it. So if you want something creative and wonderful to do in the work of God, ask him for a plan that nobody else has and is waiting for you. Okay, number three, the third point, and you hope it's the last, and it is, learn contentment. Remember, we're preparing for Thanksgiving, so we have a real Thanksgiving day. Empty you of yourself, then ask God to fill you with his spirit, and then through that, you're going to find, let me say this, when we say empty us of ourselves, I want to read from Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. Mark it. This is what we need to empty. If you're looking around and say, oh, you know, compared to that one, I'm not such a big sinner. Let me read you the list. As St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5. Verses 19 to 21. He says, now the works of the flesh, our carnal self, not our spiritual self, are evident, which are, number one, adultery. Number two, fornication, sex outside of marriage. Number three, uncleanness. Number four, lewdness. Number five, idolatry. Number six, 
sorcery. Number seven, hatred. Number eight, contentions. Number nine, jealousies. Number 10, outbursts of wrath. Number 11, selfish ambitions. Number 12, dissensions. Number 13, heresies. Number 14, envy. Number 15, murder. Number 16, drunkenness. Number 17, revelries and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mark it down. Galatians chapter 4. Five, verses 19 to 21. And then he says in the 22nd to the 24th verses, but the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, this fruit, it's not a gift. A gift is what God gives you. A fruit is what you produce, right? If you come to my house, I've got a Christmas tree artificial one, but if I had a real one, every season I change the decorations. I hang different things on it. Right now, if you want to see fall in Maui, I can invite you to my house. It looks like fall. I miss the fall on the mainland. But the tree doesn't produce anything. I put things on to decorate it. And so the gifts of the Spirit is like that. God gives you this gift to kind of decorate your life. But the fruit comes from an alive tree. And if it is a mango tree, it's going to produce bacon. Did I hear bacon? (laughs) If it's a mango tree, it's going to produce mangoes. Yes. How do you know it's a mango tree? What if we go to the tree we, we've been watering all this time and we think it's a mango tree, but a papaya comes out of it? You know, it's not a mango tree. It's a papaya tree. The fruit tells us what the tree is like. And so God says, these are the fruit of those who are filled with my spirit. We can tell what kind of tree you are by the fruit that comes out of your life. Kind of scary, isn't it? But the fruit of the spirit is number one, love. So the top of the list, love. Love is so important. Love is so hard. It's hard to love you, except I get it from God first. Real pure love. Because see, a lot of times, our love is connected to our likes. If I like you, I love you. If I don't like you, I don't love you. That's a kind of carnal kind of love. But the God kind of love, which we should all have, comes from God. If you're a loving person, it's because you have gone to the throne room of God. God is love. You've gotten a supply from him. So you can love everybody whether you like them or not. You know, I think if we're honest and look around, there's nobody that I like 100%. <laughs> I hate to admit it. I'm the pastor. You know, you do some weird things. You're not like me in certain areas. I can't stand that. Right? I'm not the only one. I see some of you smiling behind your mask. Most of us, we don't like each other all the time. But if we go to God, we're commanded to love each other. He's made us unique, and that's why you don't like me all the time, because I'm unique, and I'm not like you, and you're not like me. And so we don't like many times, but we're commanded to love one another. And the reason why God makes it so is because we would have to depend on him for the supply. Have you seen some people? I don't know what's behind their thoughts. A lot of times I've found that it's manifested in 
in arthritis or migraine headaches, but the sweetest people, they seem to love everybody all the time, and yet maybe it's so buried in them their resentment or dislike that it manifests in a physical ailment. We cannot love each other. Don't feel guilty if you don't love everybody. Only feel guilty if you've not asked God for a supply because he'll give you abundantly so you can look at a person and love them, encourage them to finish well. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience. Kindness, there it is again. Love is kind. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are fruit. We can see what kind of tree you are by the fruit that comes out of your life. And it says, against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. That's why we can do it with his, its passions and desires. We are not going to be led by our flesh because we are filled with his spirit and his fruit then is produced in us. The last point, as I said, learn contentment. In Philippians 4, 8, Paul says, not that I speak in respect of lack or want, for I have learned that in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. You're not going to be thankful this Thanksgiving day if you're not content with what you have. If you're dwelling on what you don't have, you're not going to be thankful. Let me tell you. You know when St. Paul says this, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians, and this will be the last passage of scripture about learning to be content. It's a learned thing. You have to learn contentment. Let that sink in. You have to learn how to be content. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28, 23 to 28. Remember, he said he's learned to be content. This is what he went through. Are they, mem are they members, ministers of Christ? Then I speak as a fool. I am also more. In labors, more abundant. That means I work harder than most people. In stripes, above measure. I've been beaten up many times. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths. Often, he was near death many times. From the Jews, five times, I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times, I was beaten with rods. Once, I was stoned. Three times, I was shipwrecked. A night and a day have been in the deep, that means in a deep pit, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in the perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Through all of this, Paul says, I've learned to be content. When he was in prison, he wrote the book of Philippians, that short little letter that is full of joy. Why? He had been beaten. He had been gone through a lot of suffering. And why? Because he had learned to be content. And then from the 12th chapter, the 7th verse, he says, 
he had a thorn in the flesh. He says, lest I be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. That means God has revealed so many things to me. I've written you know, letters and so forth. Lest I be exalted. You think more highly than me or I think more highly of myself. He says, I have a thorn in the flesh it was given to me as a messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Then he says, therefore, most gladly I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest in me. Therefore, I take pleasure in the infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because Christ has taught him to be content. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Maybe you're feeling sorry for yourself, and I've had requests for prayer for people who are suffering. I've been in touch with news about the persecuted Christians. Some of them are living in caves without food or water and trusting God for deliverance. Have you been praying for them? When you take a shower tonight, thank God for the water. Thank God for the hot water. When you open your refrigerator, it may have only a few things, but you have a refrigerator, most of you. When you lie down in your bed and look up, Thank God for the roof over your head. I was thinking about Mary teaching us that song. Roof over head, food on my table. We need to be really grateful to the Lord. So I want this week to position ourselves for gratefulness. If you're an American, you are richer than 94, or I read the statistics once, it's in the 90s percent of the people in the world if you're an American, even if you're homeless. People take care of you. We've had supplies. And if we want to help ourselves, help is available in America. Focus on what you have and not what you don't have. Some of you are lonely Maybe your marriage is broken up and you're hurting. Jesus is available. Jesus is available. If you're an outsider looking in and you don't understand a lot of things and you want your life to change, that is the big, biggest thing you can do for yourself. Just admit that you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. You're sick and tired of serving Satan who has made your life miserable. You want to turn your life over to Jesus who promises you an abundant life here and a home he has prepared with your name on it in heaven. But it's your decision. Will you decide to follow Jesus? If today is the day that you're going to cross over from death into life, I want you to say this prayer, dear Jesus. Thank you for loving me just the way I am. Thank you for seeing my pain and my brokenness. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to hear how much you love me and died for me. Thank you for taking the punishment for all my sins on that cross, I confess that I'm a sinner and I cannot 
help myself. I invite you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. I give you my brokenness. Write my name in your book of life. And I promise to serve you with your help the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, for everyone who said that simple prayer of confession and repentance and an invitation for you to come in, set them free right now. Confirm that they're being born again from the flesh into the kingdom of God in the spiritual realm so they can live victoriously. Thank you for being faithful to your promise. Receive them now. Assure them with signs and wonders following the joy of the Lord, the peace of God that passes understanding. Let these be theirs today. Let them know that you've come and touched their lives and you've accepted them forever into your kingdom. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like for us to stand and as we dismiss today, I'd like for us to sing this. I asked the music group to do it. This world is not my home. Maybe you don't have a real nice house. Maybe you don't have a house at all, but you've got a phone and you're watching us. Just remember, we're just traveling through, so don't camp where you are. Expect God to move you on. And let's sing this. Come back tonight at 6 o'clock for tonight's special two-hour service. We're going to have a lot of anointing here. Bring your friends with you. Amen. God bless you. This world is not my this world home. Is not my I'm home. just passing I'm through. Just my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore they're all expecting me and that's one thing I know my Savior's pardoned me and now I onward go I know he'll take me through through all and weak and poor I can't feel at home in this world anymore just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their sound the sweetest praise drip back from heaven shore. And I can feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Jesus is coming soon. Be faithful. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Come back tonight at 6.